Uh, thanks everybody for joining our Naturalist Journeys um, program series this winter. I want to start out by just thanking um, all of our sponsors that make this possible. So big thanks to Hunger Mountain Co-op, thanks to Union Mutual, to Washington Electric Co-op, to Onion River Outdoors, and to the Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix. Um, without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this. And this is, I think, our 26th or 27th year of Naturalist Journeys. Um, but this tonight might be a first of, uh, of cross-pollinating with uh, Bonnie Vale, our, our, um, uh, our soulmates down in, in Brattleboro. Um, and so it's a pleasure to have uh, Patty here this evening to tell us all about the Willow clan. Um, a couple other housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, um, if folks uh, have a good time this evening and are enjoying our Naturalist Journey series, um, I encourage you to become a member, or make a donation to uh, North Branch Nature Center and to Bonnyvale, of course. So you can go to northbranchnaturecenter.org for us and you can go to BEEC, so Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center, BEEC.org over there. So um, show, show Bonnyvale and the Nature Center some love if you uh, have a good time. And um, Feel free to ask questions um, throughout tonight. Um, you can either put your question in the chat or you can put it over in the Q&A panel. So either one of those, you'll, that'll go right to me. And um, I'll either um, uh, pepper in questions to Patty as we go, or I might hold your question till the end, um, depending on, on the content of your question. But feel free to, uh, to pipe in and ask questions in the chat or Q&A. And, &A. and uh, yeah, that's, that's everything on my list of, of housekeeping tasks. So without further ado, Patty, thank you so much for, for joining us here this evening. And we look forward to, uh, to meeting, meeting Willow. Well, thank you, Sean. And it's uh, great to be here virtually in one of my very favorite parts of Vermont and have a chance to reminisce about a very dear friend of mine. For those of you who may be new to Bonnyvale, we are based down in West Brattleboro, have a 200 year old plus farmstead. So in some ways, very similar to North Branch. We offer natural history program for programming for the public, nature-based science education for the region's elementary schools, vacation day camps, teen naturalist outings, salamander crossing brigades, and uh, wildlife rehabilitation. Tonight, I am going to share the story of Willow, a very extraordinary beaver on two counts. I'm going to practice my transitioning here to advance the slides. Here we go. Um, extraordinary because she lived to a remarkable old age, something very few wild animals do, especially beavers, given that their longevity is 20 years. The other thing that is remarkable about this beaver is her fantastic work as an ambassador. And I'm going to take you back and we're going to imagine the very beginning of her life, which is something that I am a little bit better able to do, having now been mother to a beaver myself. <laughs> this is uh, Pumpkin, a beaver kit that I have been raising for the last couple of years. Hey, there. I have a lot to say, and a lot of it is complete. Goodbye, Pumpkin. We're now going back to imagining Willow's life. So once upon a time, maybe around the turn of the century and maybe in a lodge on Popple's Pond, a beaver kit was born in May and may have had another sibling or two. And this video that you're about to see is uh, your invitation to head into a beaver lodge through a pipe that I inserted into the top of the lodge. Uh, this is for one of Willow's grandchildren, Charlie, who was such a small baby beaver in the fall that I thought I might offer supplemental feeding. So here we are now with this little tiny boroscope camera in the lodge and we can see beavers moving around. There's some mist and steam in there. There's some beaver fur. So, and there's, there's little Charlie's nose. So we're gonna pretend that this is Willow. And in this lodge, the baby beavers are born fully furred with their eyes open. 
and uh, with the siblings, they um, do a lot of wrestling. They squeak excitedly when their parents arrive. They wrestle. Their older siblings, here's, here's Willow checking out her, rather her mother do checking out the camera. Um, so <laughs> that was just too distracting. I forgot what I was in the middle of saying. So here's, here's uh, Do's nose and keep an eye out because the baby beaver is about to appear, appear again. So these, uh, this cozy little den life lasts for about a month. The beaver, baby beavers will be exploring the open water that's in the lodge and will not venture out because they're too buoyant to swim out until mama wrestles them right out. And because this is also the story of a relationship, I'll tell you a little bit about the other party. My own birth was very well documented, let's say a long, long time ago in southeastern Vermont. And like Willow, I grew up in a den with siblings, but my three brothers were not much inclined to help with my care, nor did we engage in mutual grooming. But as soon as I could, I was crawling off after animals. And like most kids, I expected my love to be reciprocated, and I, I still have scars from the mauling I received by a very annoyed cat and uh, was bitten by the family dog. However, I did remain fascinated by the lives of wild neighbors and became content to learn about them by reading and following their tracks. I admired beavers, of course, for the wonderful wetland mosaics they create, and my relationship with them might have remained one of distant admiration had I not discovered a book on a friend's bookshelf. The book was called Beaver Sprite, and it was about a crazy beaver lady, Dorothy Richards, who had beavers reintroduced in her backyard in the Adirondacks in the 1930s, and really thought nothing much of it until she went out to see what the beavers had done a month later or so and was astonished to discover the transformation they had made to the little brook that flowed through a field and now it was habitat for heron and fish and ducks and the beavers themselves and uh, it's it's a wonderful book and it really opened my eyes to the personality and the humor and intelligence of beavers Dorothy went on to get a permit to raise beavers in her house. Rather famously, uh, this headline caption says, Hunk and I were equally pleased with our affection for one another. And um, she eventually built an outdoor pool so the beavers could come and go. And here's, here they are, helpfully bringing in firewood. I, I suspect, actually, that no, they're carrying firewood out to their pool. So I decided that I would be able to have a relationship with a beaver. Now the rewards of a trusting relationship with a wild animal are really beyond measure. But the wild animal's well-being must be given precedence. Any animal that ranges widely will encounter people who do not merit trust. But the beavers in my wild backyard seldom encounter other people and never stray far from their aquatic haunts. And so I resolved that yes, I could make friends with a beaver. And here the two lives intersect. I headed down the very next spring as soon as the ice went out, hoping to, to meet the beavers that I knew lived out there in a little pond about a mile from my house. I resolved that I would sit right out in the open and try to act as little like a predator as possible. I wouldn't stare at the beavers. I would busy myself with other things. I might say a casual hello if they swam by. And of course, that's what they did. They swam by. And But beavers are curious creatures. In my experience, they are one of three of the, the wild mammals of Vermont who 
are uh, mellow enough to bestow their trust readily on people, uh, the other two being skunks and porcupines. And these three animals all have a very clear place or way of being secure in the world. When beavers are in their ponds, they are really invincible. And um, so within uh, several visits, the beavers were very happy to just stop slapping their tails and stop looking at me and go about their business. And uh, here is Willow when I first met her in 2007. And she was the first beaver to really decide to trust me. And of course, this was after nine visits. She's not coming up here just because she thinks I might be interesting, but I have been bringing them aspen to eat. And um, these little rodent nuggets that are a treat that I feed to beavers in rehabilitation. So they're very nutritious. And I offered, this is a small consideration for my imposing on their their peaceful pond habitat. And it's really only by sitting at a beaver pond and watching that you can figure out how many beavers are actually there because they can submerge and swim for and be underwater for many minutes. I mean, up to 15 if stressed. But I was eventually able to figure out that Willow lived there with two other beavers, her mate Popple and a young beaver bunchberry, but I was very, very keen to know if they had kits. I had reason to think that they might because they had a lodge in this old section of dam and, and often swam over there towing bedding and towing uh, materials for kits to eat. I, and I did finally see kits, but not until late in the summer. It was August 1st before they were swimming around in the pond when I was there. And they had no interest in coming over, of course. And then one day a funny thing happened and I'm not gonna read too much into this, but Willow was over eating biscuits with me and she didn't finish them. She just swam away and came back with this little beaver in tow. And I called this beaver Ducky because he was ever so buoyant, floating like a baby duck. And after uh, she made this introduction, she swam away and the, the little ducky stayed there. And again, I don't know why, but he seemed to think I was pretty interesting. So this is really a long, a long story to, to tell you in one evening. So I've I figured out a way to condense it. Um, the beavers that summer, this is a, a drawing I've made that shows where the different ponds that the beavers have inhabited over the years are. And this is a Popple's pond right here. Can you see my cursor? Yep, we can see the cursor. Okay, great. Um, and one of the things I've learned about the beavers in this particular habitat is that they move every single year. It's, it's terrible habitat. Uh, the ponds are all surrounded by spruce and fir and red maple, foods that are not preferred food for beavers. And each year, Willow, the matriarch, gave birth to two kits, and each year, one of them was killed before the end of the summer, and the other survived. So at the end of that summer at Popple's Pond, they all disappeared, and I finally found them up at this pond that I called Surprise Pond. And uh, we are going to rejoin them the next year when they move down to this little pond called Lake Dismal. And I called it that, it was, they made a very small dam that made a long narrow pond. And to get there, you had to uh, thrash through this spruce hell and uh, squish yourself down between the spruce trees. But that turned out to be the most amazing place for beaver watching. It was so intimate. When I found a place to sit on the bank, it turned out to be right next to the bank lodge where the beavers would swim in and out. And as you probably know, beavers are nocturnal primarily. And uh, I would arrive in the evening and the beavers would come out and the, the stream was still narrow enough there that they tended to concentrate in that area. And it was a family of 
five beavers at that time. Oh, no, actually, Willow's first mate, Popple, had died. And uh, so it was Willow and her son, who she married, Bunchberry, married. Um, one of the kids from the earlier year, and that summer, they had had two more kids. So here we are enjoying an evening at Lake Dismal. So eventually, they started to pile up sticks right above that bank lodge where I was sitting. And um, I was able to listen to them digging up through the bank and building their lodge. And this, this next little set of photos just shows you how the pond grew and developed. So look at this nice yellow birch over here that they are chewing on. And by the time they got it cut down, the pond had come right up to the base of that tree. And the next year, this is what the pond looked like. So here's the pile of branches that emerged above my seat. And at this stage, they had begun to hollow out the inside of the lodge. And inside, if I looked through the cracks, I could see the, the two baby beavers in there all fluffy. It's not a condition you often get to see beavers in. And I was, I was spending nights sleeping down there to set up a beaver camp and had a spot where I would just roll out my sleeping bag right next to this lodge. And all night long, all night long, the beavers would be working on the lodge and I would hear the pitter patter of their feet as they, they had a little runway. They'd get up speed with their arm load of mud and sticks, run as far up the lodge as they could and then dump it and then push it on and rock everything into place. And here is how the lodge advanced. So in the fall, and you've probably all seen this, and this is how you can tell that a beaver lodge is active in the fall. They, they cover it with a layer of mud that freezes like concrete. And out here in front of the lodge is their winter food cache. They, they submerge a big pile of woody twigs and branches, and that's what they're going to be eating once the pond freezes and they can't get out. <laughs> and this is Willow. She's about to demonstrate how very much they like to keep the water open. She, beavers, if they can help it, I've never seen a beaver just walk out across ice. They are, would be extremely vulnerable. So let's see if this video will work and, ah. Well, that video won't work, but they have a few different methods that they use for keeping ice open. They, they use the chew method, which beavers are, of course, very well adapted for. They will also, where it's shallow, uh, get underneath and push up with their backs. And they'll also lunge up onto it and use their weight to try and break it from above. And once they're frozen in, it can, it can be for months. And it offers some interesting opportunities for beaver watching, especially if you have black ice, you can follow their progress across the pond underneath the water by either seeing them or following the bubbles. And here you can see their food cache poking up through the ice. Interesting, as you can see, they've got yellow birch here and some hemlock. And in my experience, they, they do not utterly spurn evergreens. They seem to use them as a spice condiment, if you will. And uh, here they are tucked into their lodge for the winter. You can tell an active lodge in the winter because the warm beavers in there, their breath and bodies will keep a vent hole melted in the top. The very top of the lodge is the one spot that they do not mud over. And then uh, a February thaw and the beavers are out and now can reach some of the branches that they were unable to reach in the, the fall when they got hung up on other trees. So they're enjoying this nice beach park. 
And at last spring arrives. Here's Willow. And here you can see one of the things that makes her a distinctive as far as her appearance goes. See that you can see the white around her eyes there. When she was a, a young beaver, she did have these kind of bulging eyes. Another important spring activity is uh, making scent mounds so that any other beavers who are out moving around and trying to establish territories know what's occupied and what isn't and what the status of the individuals there might be. Willow's a little shy here because what she's about to do might be a little embarrassing. It's okay. Hey, Will. It's okay, Will. So she's a female and she's engaged in scent marking. And the males also do it. So they scrape together some debris and then do a little wiggle dance and, and squirt some castorium onto that scent mound. Uh, grooming, of course, is always important. This is her her mate slash son bunch berry demonstrating an important ritual. They have uh, a toenail on that hind foot, the second one in that is split, and he's using it here as a comb to work oil through his coat. Very important. And once beavers are, are comfortable with you, you can just sit nearby. And this is one of the greatest joys to, to watch a fat beaver bring himself. It's a tail guitar here. That later in the spring, I think it was sometime in June, I met my very favorite baby beavers. And because I had been spending so much time there and right outside the lodge, these kits, the dewberries, I call them, came right ashore the very first time that they were out swimming with their mother. This is not smart beaver behavior. Um, some kits, curiously enough, stay in the water until late in the year, but these two, they were so bold. And here, this little Dewberry floating around out here is going to demonstrate how they eat leaves. They roll them up like, uh, like they're making a scroll. And uh, eat them from one end. And this other little dewberry, I can't tell them apart, is uh, excited to come find out about those apples. Ah, uh, yes. Um, one of the greatest things about spending time at a beaver pond is that these wetlands, these ponds are magnets for all kinds of life. And, and maybe it's just me, but I personally believe there's never a dull moment at a beaver pond. This is, this is the one surviving dewberry who's uh, made it into the fall and is, is the only lap beaver I've ever known. And uh, visiting her at night, well, we'll get back to that. There's another picture coming up. One of the most interesting creatures that I met at beaver camp was my friend, Terrible Jack the Moose. And he was a, a very sad, adolescent moose who had just been given the boot by his mother so she could now devote herself to her new calf. And he had been with his mother, as all moose calves are, for the entire first year of life. And he was just beside himself with to be without mother and all alone in the world and was very interested in having a friend, even a very strange looking friend like me. And we spent a lot of time for a few days just hanging out in the meadow next to the beaver pond. We would hang out by the camp and, and eventually he was so interested in having a relationship with someone that he got up his nerve to approach me. And I, I reached out my hand and he tagged my hand with his nose and that became our, our little contact. But 
It was a very confusing relationship for him. I was not his mother. Was I someone to play with? Um, <laughs> but eventually, after about a week, terrible Jack seemed to become more independent. And the last time I saw him, he strolled over to where I was sitting by the shores of the beaver pond one evening and the beaver swam over and slapped their tails and and he just had an air of confidence and he nibbled a few branches and then wandered off and I did not see him again. So, excuse me for a moment, I thought I turned this off. Oh, pardon me. So the other remarkable thing about Willow was the, the opportunity her trust in me provided to introduce her to other people. And over the years that I knew her, I probably took hundreds of people out to have an intimate experience with a beaver. And along the way, we talked about how beavers hold water on a heating planet and create wetland habitat. And they get a chance to walk up along the brook and, and see for themselves the great things that happen, not only because beavers live in a place, but because move, beavers move from place to place and create such a dynamic environment. And I have also been uh, writing about Willow in a, a monthly column that I do for the local paper. And she has a lot of fans who read about her on first Saturday of the month. So I'm just going to take you along uh, with this group of people who came out from Green River Watershed Alliance studying beavers, flooding, and uh, climate change. <laughs> that beaver just appeared on cue and swam right up and wanted to join the picnic. And she was just bomb-proof by this stage in her life and was did not care how many people were there. And yes, she let people pet her. And so they were all very thrilled to meet Willow. This picture at that event shows that she was at this stage in her life and for the last five years of her life, she was blind in one eye and yet still somehow this amazing beaver survived. So a little chronology just to give you a sense of how remarkable that is. Um, when I first met her, she had to have been at least six years old there at Popple's Pond, but she looked like a mature beaver and perhaps even an elderly beaver at that point. Her hips jutted out a bit. And uh, then she moved up here, had a couple more kids, moved down here, had a couple more kids, moved down here, had a couple more kids, moved back up here, moved up here. Um, and sort of at the height of her dynasty, the maximum number of beavers in her colony, just because they, the young would disperse, was five. Eventually, though, her, her most, uh, the mate that she had for the longest period of time, Bunchberry, for about five years, he disappeared along with Sundew. And so in 2013, that was the year that the decline began. And for a couple of years, she didn't have any kits. In 2015, she was seen with another beaver in the fall, but by the spring, she was by herself. And it was back here, just up above Popple's Pond in this little tiny pond. I could never figure out where she was living. 
but I was really relieved to see her in the spring because I'm assuming all this time she's an old beaver, but I have no idea how old. When she finally comes out in the spring, she was really skinny and she was just covered in beaver ticks. These are uh, beaver specialist ticks and they are white and they can really uh, make beavers anemic in the way that the, the moose ticks do with moose. Fortunately, I was able to treat her for those ticks and they disappeared. And the, the treatment that I gave her was uh, through a vet and that was ivermectin. It also dewormed her. And by gosh, that beaver um, was restored to health. And over the next few years, she had two more mates, George and Henry. Um, but no more kits. Well, until... And here we'll move ahead. She eventually moved to my great surprise to join a beaver that was living way up on another tributary, a uh, handsome young fellow, Henry. And that year she had another kit, just the, just the one as far as I knew. And that kit's name was Gentian. And now we're gonna just jump ahead to 2019 in the fall. And here she is with her, her mate, Henry. And by this time, she's really having a hard time moving and it's clear that she's very old. And um, this is probably the last picture that I took of her. You can see how skinny she is. And at this point, I'm going to read for you the final column that I wrote about Willow for the local paper. Let me just see if I can find it here. Here we go. Oh, um, this picture just shows that uh, they're living in this really funky little bank lodge. And you can see that they're plastering it away, but they, they with the three beavers, and maybe because they're both getting older, I don't know, they just did not make a very fancy lodge. So here is a portion of that column that I wrote. I've speculated about the superpowers that kept her alive while so many other beavers disappeared. She's been blind in one eye and uh, for the past five years and has had the disheveled bony appearance of advanced age for nearly as long. I suspect she was close to the maximum age for a beaver. The record for a beaver in captivity is 23 years. Beavers in the wild seldom attain half that age. This year, the signs of age were more pronounced. Willow sometimes choked on her food and she moved painfully down slopes. When Henry and Gentian put on fat in the fall, she remained skinny. I began to suspect she had worn her molars down so far she had a hard time chewing. Death seemed to hover close. I hoped that she would die peacefully of natural causes. But because her superpowers must be waning with age, her chances of being killed by a predator were increasing. However she died, I hoped I would find her remains. Crazy, I know. But for the closure, that's only possible with such proof and because her teeth would allow me to determine her age. In late November, after the first snow of the year, I heard a beaver's tail slap warning when I arrived at the pond. Henry made a brief appearance, um, but seemed nervous and swam away again. Willow didn't show up. I tried not to worry, but Henry's anxiety was contagious. The next night I headed to the pond again, hopeful that I would find the wayward beaver and I was prepared to search if I didn't. But only Henry came when I called. I wandered downstream to previous ponds and back on the far side of the brook. I found no recent sign of Willow, but many reminders of the hours spent on those shores. When I arrived at the far side of the pond, I could see young gentian out on the ice processing a tree they had felled. 
From that vantage, I also saw the tracks of a bear. The bear had walked across the slushy surface of the pond the previous night and pawed at the roof of one of the beaver's temporary lodges. I spent the next hour following beaver trails. I followed one set of tracks so far I began to fear that Willow had just wandered off cross country as old creatures are rumored to do when they hear death call. At last, the trail turned back toward home. I did not see the tracks I dreaded, those of a carnivore at a kill site. Still, I had been at the pond for hours and Willow would have made an appearance if she'd been able to. The next morning, I set myself the grim task of determining her fate. There's some pictures from that next morning. If I could find evidence of a predator attack, I would assume that Willow had, if I couldn't, I would assume that she had achieved the near impossible, dying of old age and nature. Frost crystals gleamed on the sedges by the pond and a light skim of ice crystallized into snowflake patterns on the open water. I followed beaver trails up the hillside. I could see that Willow at her advanced age had traveled some distance to do some logging. I saw no evidence of predation. So I returned to the place where the bear tracks left the scene. The tracks continued along the hill and up a stone wall and up some stone steps to a cellar hole. Bare feet left impressions along the edge of the foundation. At a corner, it looked like the bear had paused to goof around with a, with a branch since the tracks went back and forth and a groove appeared beside them. As the tracks continued into the woods, the groove went with them. The bear was dragging something. I knew what I would find. The pile of sawdust under a skim of ice looked like bedding from a squirrel's nest at first. When it registered as Willow's last meal, I dropped to my knees and howled my sorrow to the still forest. The depth of grief is a measure of love, so I welcome it. And I loved that old beaver. Nearby, I found the bare earth where the feasting occurred. There was a joyful convergence of tracks as scavengers arrived to clean up. Coyote and fisher and fox tracks mingled with the bears and every bit of that old beaver had disappeared. As I studied the trampled earth, I noticed a couple of bone fragments. There, where the beaver became bare, were Willow's lower jaws with their worn shiny molars. The wild things had left me my share, and I apologize for this gruesome picture, but this is what I found. And so these are the, these are beaver incisors, those sharp teeth that keep on growing and are kept filed like a chisel. And here are the molars in the back, and you can see that the back molars were worn way down, but this front one was forming a, a spike that must have just made it so difficult to eat. A week later, I made my sad return trek to the pond. The section of ice near the entrance to the lodge was slushy and I made an opening with my ski pole. I called Henry and waited for many anxious minutes before I heard the gurgles that announced his approach. He rose to the surface wearing a cap of ice. We'll switch to a better picture here. There he is. and then lumbered up the sloughing snowbank to beach himself in magnificent portliness for a treat. In his company by the moonlit pond, I found my farewells had already been said. The night demanded I pay attention to what was there, not what was missing. I could feel Willow's presence in gentian snoozing in the lodge nearby. Will she share her mother's remarkable traits? If she does, she will live a long life and she will share it with us. So by way of a, an epilogue, a couple of years ago in the middle of the winter, oh my gosh, it was December when this beaver arrived just below my house in the Harrisville Brook and built a new dam and built a lodge. I have no idea what calamity forced the beaver to relocate there, but it 
was one of Will's daughters. It was Dew. And uh, I'm not sure if it was Sundew or uh, Dewberry. <laughs> I can't tell them apart that well. But I was not too worried about her because she had Willow's genes. And in fact, she did persist and survive that winter and is one of the two beavers still living on the Harrisville Brook. There's been a lot of attrition. I, I think probably the coyotes in, this, in these woods have figured out that beavers are edible. But the next spring when I went down to visit Dew, I uh, saw a bear, this darn rogue bear. I don't think of bears as typically eating beavers, but I think this one has figured out that uh, you can uh, live for a while on a beaver and it's a great way to fatten up for the winter. So this bear was hanging out by Dew's den and I tried to scare it off, but I uh, failed. And so the next day I went down and sure enough that the lodge had been dug up and Dew had been injured by this bear. And that little, there was a little beaver that just swam off in the background and that was gentian just paying do a visit. I was so worried. Um, I came down a few days later and do was lying out in the sun in the middle of the day, which is not what beavers do and coughing and coughing and coughing. And the next morning I went down with a, a shroud. I hadn't decided what to do with her, but she was gone. And I found her upstream looking much better, and she had shacked up with Willow's former mate, Henry. Henry has since disappeared. It's only these remarkable female beavers who seem to persist. And uh, this summer, another beaver has reappeared in the brook just down below my house and has built a marvelous dam and a lodge and I assume is sleeping cozily in there on this very cold night. And that is Gentian, the, the very late surprise child of Willow. So we have these two beavers that I'm hoping will carry on her legacy. And I really appreciate you all joining me this evening to hear stories of this remarkable beaver. And at this point, I will open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, I'll invite folks to add questions to uh, either the chat or the q and um, I have a few that came in. We can dive right in. Um, first of all, the reference to playing tail guitar is <laughs> one that I'm going to remember. That was, that was adorable. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, how old do you think um, Willow was when she died. You said that you first saw her in 2007. Um, and at that point she was, you thought maybe six years old. So what, approaching 18 or 19? She, she had to be at least 16. And just given um, the senescence, the, the aging that I saw, I think she was probably at the upper end of a beaver's life expectancy when she did die. So I think she probably was a 20 year old beaver if I had to guess. And if anyone out there has the, the tools for aging teeth, I still haven't found a lab that will do it. And I'm not sure they can really do it to the precision I was hoping for, but I would still love to send one of her teeth in to see if I can get a count. Well, we hope that that person materializes for, uh, for this, this study. Um, a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, before, uh, while I while I read uh, these other ones that are coming in, I wanted to pose one to you about um, just as a as an educator, as a as a professional naturalist. If you could speak a little bit to the ethics around uh, feeding wildlife, um, you know, I you know we all kind of land in different places on this and recognize there's a big difference between feeding the birds your bird feeder and feeding donuts to bears. Um, and this strikes me as something that is uh, clearly in between those things, but in your time with, with Willow and family, I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to, uh, to uh, uh, how and why and what you're feeding these animals and just bigger picture um, what you advocate for uh, to the public. 
Yes, absolutely. That is a very important topic of uh, discussion. I certainly do not want to suggest that it's wise to feed any wild animals that you should encounter. As I mentioned earlier, uh, any animal that's going to be wide ranging and likely to encounter other people should not get the idea that people are to be trusted. That's, that's one consideration. If an animal learns to trust people and then uh, say, say it's a fox or a bear or a raccoon and, and goes up to someone else who is not comfortable with animals, they may be very frightened and fear that it has rabies or something like that. And it's likely to be dispatched. Um, so beavers are an unusual animal in that they are tied very much to their aquatic environment and aren't going to follow anyone home and aren't going to go knocking on doors. And in my experience with these guys, the things that I brought them were really treated as a minor snack. They would eat a few and then they would go right off and resume eating the things that I would think would be very boring, like um, twigs and branches and sedges. So it's, uh, it's something that requires a lot of thought, but I would not have had the same relationship that I did with these beavers if I hadn't given them a little incentive to take an interest in me. Um, so that was my reason for doing it. And, and I was being careful and observant and definitely do not take this as an invitation to uh, go out and feed any animal you encounter. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so a few, um, a few questions on kind of beaver, beaver society here. Um, so is it common for beavers to mate with family members? Um, sadly, well, I shouldn't say sadly, it seems to work for them, but it is fairly common. Their mating season is in the middle of the winter and they're frozen under the ice. So their chances of dispersing and finding another mate, um, well, they, they simply don't exist. So if it happens to be a family member who's available, if, if a mate dies or is lost in the preceding summer, then they will often choose to mate with a son or daughter. They do, they do mate for life is what, what the common wisdom is. And uh, so I assume that the five mates that, be, that Willow lost during her lifetime weren't really driven off by her bad attitude. I think that uh, something probably happened to all of them. Um, let's see. Um, is it true that the teenagers are often kicked out of the territory? There are uh, mixed opinions on that. I think that anecdotally, some people have seen what appears to be the parents driving youngsters away. In my experience, I never saw that happen. And in fact, at least one kid spent five years with the family before disappearing. Um, I And every beaver family is different. It may be that there is a lot of, of pressure. I can imagine that a beaver family like the one that Dorothy was uh, observing where she had six kits over and over again that the parents might be pretty eager to chase them away. Uh, in the case of my beavers where there was usually one surviving kit and the kit from the year before, I think that once the kids got to be two or three or four, they would just decide on their own to head out. Um, another question was just how many kits Willow had, to your knowledge. Yes. Oh, in her lifetime? Yep. Oh, gosh. Let's see. One, two, 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 three. The ones that I knew of, she had six surviving kits and a total of 12, 13 kits. But she probably had a number before I knew her. 
Um, while we're in the, the, the family structure um, category, the Jeopardy category here, um, I'll read uh, this one from Flask. I had learned that uh, beavers were matriarchal, uh, but recently was advised uh, otherwise. Can you clarify the family structure? Um, who is it that holds the territory, the male or female or other? Oh, I, I have never heard that either one was um, dominant. I know that both male and female, in fact, the whole family will join together to defend the territory if there's an interloper. And they do it very aggressively. In uh, the year before Willow died, she was in a fight with another beaver that, that arrived in their pond. I think it might have been a female beaver. And I think the, that her mate, Henry, at that time was not as interested in driving this beaver away. But Willow succeeded and ended up with a big gash in her tail as a, as a uh, mark of honor. And that's also one of the ways you can tell beavers apart, incidentally, is when they fight, they often do bite each other's tails and will leave scars. And she had a little nick in her tail that was one of the features that made her distinctive throughout her life. Um, I think the kits will join into uh, these fights as well. And beavers are, you think about it, their habitat is so restricted. There are so few streams and rivers that are suitable for beaver habitation. It has to be a low gradient river where you, it's not very flashy. So more like up in the headwaters, unless they're lucky enough to live in a big river that doesn't require damming at all. And so if you're not, if you're not willing to fight to the death to defend your territory, you, you may also just be out of luck. And I, it's the, territory holders that usually prevail in these fights. Um, uh, to set you up for something you were just talking about in the middle of that, um, uh, Heather's asking, I once followed a beaver on a hiking trail for what I remember was around 20 minutes. Any guesses as to where they were going and what they were doing? Wow, what time of year was that? We'll see if Heather chimes back in here. But my thought was, moving to a different tributary or something like that. Yeah, yeah they, it must have been dispersing, but... Um, well, uh, Heather says the fall. Uh, the fall, yeah, that's a, a strange time to be dispersing, but in the event of a calamity, we had our, my friend Dew dispersing in December or January. Typically, if they can, they'll move up or down a stream because they're so vulnerable when they're going cross country. But if they can't find a, a good site, they will show up in all kinds of crazy places. So Heather, you must have just found a beaver that was en route, hoping to find another home. And, and um, I can only guess that they are pretty good at finding water. I don't know if, if the beaver's travels would have been just random or if she, he had some idea where they were going. Um, have you ever encountered any interesting species interactions with the beavers uh, beyond, beyond the bear and beyond maybe, yeah, anything with interaction with muskrats um, or any other kind of species interactions that you came across? Oh, these, the ponds have very few muskrats. So I never saw an interaction with muskrats. Um, they, did sometimes seem to be playing games with the geese. They would follow geese around and slap their tails at them. I have no idea what that was about. Um, people often wonder if otters are predators of beaver kits. And I have never seen interactions between beavers and otters in the ponds. I only have seen otters around in the winter. But I have read other accounts where beavers have been seen, including beaver kits, in the company of otters that were moving through an area and they didn't, there didn't seem to be any um, threats made by the otters or fear displayed by the beavers. So that's anecdotally. Uh, update from Heather, she says that it was a rainy day and that the beaver uh, finally found a stream and, uh, and off they went. 
Um, so you're right that they are on the way to water somewhere. Um, so uh, another great question. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, beaver food caches and what's going on with that behavior? Uh, I had a great chance to watch uh, that baby beaver I showed you at the very beginning make learn to make a food cache this fall without ever having seen one or or done it before himself. I had to supply all of the materials because he's now living in a, a fenced pond. Um, so what they do is they cut branches off of trees that are maybe an inch or two in diameter and swim down to the bottom of the pond and lodge them in the mud and they'll weight them down with stones and then gradually weave in more and more branches. And all winter, they'll be eating the, the bark, the cambium. It's a very uh, low nutrition food, but somehow they, they subsist. Their caloric requirements are pretty low in the winter. They manage to stay pretty cozy in their lodges, so they are not burning a lot of calories to generate heat. And they'll, so they'll just have a lazy winter, swim out of the lodge when they want a snack, drag the branch inside and eat it. And uh, pumpkin, the, the baby beaver, <laughs> it was funny to watch just because he had not figured out how to get things to stay on the bottom. You could see him swimming down and letting go and the branches would float back up. Eventually he figured out that he could stab them into the rocks on the side of the pond and that's how he made a start at his cache. Um. Thanks. A uh, quick one. Um, somebody is asking if you could remind us of the name of the book about Dorothy and the New York Beavers. Oh, it's called Beaver Sprite. Beaver Sprite. And her name is Dorothy Richards. Beaver Sprite by Dorothy Richards. Thanks. Um, so your uh, comment about um, beaver living in, in a fenced in pod at this point reminds uh, is, is a good segue to this next question, which is um, uh, from John. Uh, what, do you, what do you suggest should happen when the proximity between beavers and humans is too close? And I think perhaps that's in the context of, you know, the, just the general coexistence of, uh, of beavers and, and people. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, there are so many people in the world who do not appreciate beavers because beavers have, uh, like us, this need to alter the environment to suit their needs. And when Beavers and people claim the same territory and have different ideas about how it should look. Well, yeah, this causes a great deal of resentment on the part of humans. But fortunately, there are usually non-lethal solutions. There are many ways to resolve conflicts in these situations. And I always direct people to at least in, in Vermont, to Skip Lyle, who's the person who really pioneered beaver deceivers and has been working for many years to perfect this technology. So beavers do such important work for the world as a keystone species, creating habitat for other animals. And I always encourage people who have beavers near them to think about ways that they can keep those beavers in place, even when they're causing uh, damage to um, by flooding or by cutting down trees. There are simple ways to protect trees that you don't want to have damaged. And there are ways to regulate how high the water can get in a particular area. There are ways to keep beavers from plugging culverts and the rewards of having a beaver pond nearby just cannot be overstated. Uh, speaking, you know, from a, the very uh, anthropocentric point of view, the wildlife watching at a beaver pond is amazing. So I encourage people to try and, and limit that distance between themselves and beavers as much as possible. Yeah, well, I think that's actually a great place to leave it then. Um, uh, folks, I know there's a few uh, people who didn't uh, get their questions answered. And um, Patty, would you be willing to share with us a way that we can get in touch with you with all of our outstanding beaver-related questions? Oh, 
Yes, let's see. Let me type my email into the chat here. Um, whoops, it is. There. All right, there we go. Uh, Patty at BEC.org. Um, I just, Patty, that went to, uh, to just me. So I just reshared it back to the whole, the whole gang. But there you go. Uh, there's Patty's email. If folks have any other uh, questions um, uh, that I can help out with, I'm Sean at North Branch Nature Center.org, S E A N. Um, and we would both be happy to chat with you about anything you'd like. Um, well, I guess I shouldn't speak for speak for Patty, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah, we look forward to continuing the conversation uh, over email from here on out. Um, if folks go to northbranchnaturecenter.org/presentations uh, in a couple of days, this uh, recording will be up there, and we can share any links to books and and uh, contact info and anything like that right there on the presentation page. So, um, Patty, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. This was really really fun. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the last word. Well, I am I'm very grateful to have had this chance to be with all of you as well. And um, oh, there is another presentation coming up next Monday that I'd like to tell you all about. Ben Goldfarb, who is the author of an amazing book about beavers called Eager. I, I can't remember the the subtitle right now, but he's going to be speaking for the Green River Watershed Alliance. And I'll type in that. Oh, ah, la, 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 la. Let's see if I can remember it. Well, if you send me an email, I can I can send you a link to that. He's uh, he's a wonderful speaker, and what he is so good at is helping people to reimagine the world that existed before the fur trade, and it really was so different, especially on these low gradient streams. And he's uh, become a big advocate of letting beavers do the work, especially out in the arid west, in the fire prone west, where beavers are now being reintroduced and uh, are doing amazing work just holding water on the land. So uh, that's coming up next Monday, the 17th at seven o'clock. I just put in the chat the link to the uh, oh. Bonnyvale um, event for, oh, for that talk. So Thanks, John. Um, check that out. And I'll, uh, I'll add that link to our website under the presentation uh, since there'll be, a, there'll be some a few days between when this presentation goes up and when that happens. So. Um, great. Well, thank you again, Patty, and thanks everybody for tuning in um, and have a lovely evening. Yes, thanks all. Bye bye.